So one day, I get a phone call from the photo editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer. She sounds super casual on the phone, and she says, Evelyn, do you think you could get some photos of gunmen at night in Hebron on the Palestinian side? And I have my giant cell phone from 2001, so I pull out the antenna to make sure that I heard her correctly. And I'm a freelancer, so I say yes automatically. I take all assignments. She says, great, we knew you could do it. Be safe out there. <laughs> so, so I fold my cell phone closed, I tuck away the antenna, and I say to myself, oh my god, what did I just say yes to? How am I going to photograph gunmen in Hebron at night? Like, this could be really dangerous. They could be shooting at people, or we could be getting shot at. But then I think, ooh, this could be an exclusive, because no one else is going to go to Hebron at night during the <laughs> Intifada to take photographs of gunmen. So. Luckily, the photo editor said Hebron, because when I started covering the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I was a stringer for Reuters. So during that time, I became really good friends with the photographer and cameraman who were based in Hebron for Reuters, and they lived there. Their names were Luai and Mazen. And we were really tight, because when you're working in these dangerous situations, um, and you're running around <laughs> dodging bullets and tear gas and Molotov cocktails or hiding you know, behind mounds of burning tires, you have to look out for one another. You could accidentally get shot or hit on the head with a rock. I, in fact, did get hit on the head with a rock in a protest in Bethlehem. Cracked my head open and had to get it stitched back together. So we looked out for each other. We had each other's backs. Um, they became my brothers. So I call Luai and I say, Luai, um, could you get me some gunmen? <laughs> and that's a totally normal question in this line of work, apparently. So he says, sure, Habibti, no problem. I'll arrange everything. Come out tomorrow night. We'll have everything set up, and um, it'll be great. We'll get the shots that you need. So I say, great, thanks. See you then, inshallah. And um, <laughs> so it's out of my hands now. I just hope that they're going to get this for me, and I'm going to get my, my great story. So the next day, I put on my helmet, I Velcro up my flak jacket, and I jump in my tiny white Fiat Uno, which is like the dinkiest car on the planet. And all of the other foreign correspondents are driving around in armored SUVs <laughs> with plastic windows or bulletproof windows. And my little car is like a tin can on wheels. So I've covered my car in black gaffer tape with the letters TV. I've, <laughs> I've put TV on the roof, TV on the, on the windows and TV on the doors. And all the journalists did this because TV is the universal word for press. And it's understandable in all languages. And basically it means, I'm a journalist, don't shoot. But it's just tape, it's not magic. <laughs> so I drive from my house in Jerusalem through the West Bank to Hebron as fast as my crappy little car will take me. And I get to Hebron and it's about 10 o'clock at night. Now, Hebron is not really a rockin' city any time of the year, but <laughs> especially now during the Intifada. There are nightly shootings going on, so everybody is shuttered up in their houses. It's pretty dark. And I roll up to the Reuters office, and it's this sort of half-constructed, dingy office building. And of course, it's dark because everybody else has gone home, and I'm just hoping Luai and Mazen are inside. So I walk into the building, and I have to climb this, these dimly lit stairs. I have to go up two flights of stairs, and I'm walking up, and I get to the landing, and I see the lights are on in the office. I'm like, whew, so they're there. So I walk in the office through a cloud of cigarette smoke, and Mazin and Luai are waiting for me, and they're like, Habibti, welcome. You made it. You're here. We've got everything arranged for you. Your gunman is going to come. He's going to take you out on patrol. <laughs> And we have no idea what time he's going to get here, so we'll just hang out and wait. So we hung out for a couple hours, drank a million glasses of sweet tea, and smoked a million cigarettes, and checked the wires, looking at our competitors' photos from AP or AFP. And sometime past midnight, Mazen looks up, and he says to me, Evelyn, your guy is here. Go outside and talk to him. So my back was to the door. And I turn around, and I'm looking in this dimly lit hallway. I can barely see anything. And I make out this shadowy figure. 
There's a guy standing there in a black ski mask, holding a machine gun, a Kalashnikov, and he's waiting for me. <laughs> so I turn back to Mazen, and Mazen says, um, Evelyn, what are you waiting for? You, you know, go, what are you waiting for? Go talk to him. And I look at Mazen and I say, no fucking way. I am not going out there by myself. You can tell him to come in here. And he's like, but we arranged this for you. You know, he's here to talk to you. Go out and talk to him. And I've photographed a lot of gunmen in my career, but it's usually at protests or demonstrations. It's not usually like up close and personal where I have to walk out into a dark, scary hallway and make small talk with the guy. So I look back at Mazin and I say, look, I am not going out there in that creepy hallway by myself. You have to tell this guy to come in here. So Mazen relents and he brings the gunman inside. So the gunman sits down and he motions for me to sit across from him. So I'm really nervous. I don't know what I'm gonna say to him. You know, I don't know this guy's agenda. I don't know if he's killed anybody. I don't know anything about him. So it's a little nerve wracking and I don't know what I'm gonna say. So I grab my camera and when I'm nervous, like holding my camera, that familiar weight in my hands, it's like when you need courage and you reach out to hold someone else's hand. So I've got my camera in my hands and I sit down across from the gunman and we're sitting so close to each other that our knees are practically touching. And he's got his Kalashnikov laid out in his lap and he's bedazzled in bullets, you know, crisscrossed across his chest. And I'm sitting there and he leans into me, like right up in my face, so uncomfortably close, like no personal space. And he says, Evelyn, I know you. So I'm <laughs> leaning back trying to get, Okay, I'll stay close to the microphone. I'm leaning back trying to get some space from this guy and I'm like, uh, I, I don't know you. And he does it again. He leans in and he leans in so close. I'm trying to melt into the back of my chair and I, he's so close. I'm worried that his gun is going to slide off of his lap <laughs> and into mine. And he says again, Evelyn, I know you. And I'm like, well, how would this guy know me? Have I met him? Have I photographed him? How on earth would I know this gunman? And the only thing that I can think is, this just can't be good. <laughs> so I'm leaning back in my chair, and for the third time, he leans in close to me, and his face is right up in mine, and he looks me in the eyes, and then his mouth breaks into a smile, and he peels off his mask, and he says, Evelyn, it's Amar. I was at your birthday party last year in Jerusalem. <laughs> and I'm in total shock. I mean, my friends, Luai and Mazen, are cracking up. They just think this is the funniest thing ever, that I'm so afraid of this gunman, and it just turns out to be Amar, someone that I know, someone that came to my birthday party. And I'm like, uh, right, Amar, how have you been? What have you been up to? <laughs> I think it's pretty obvious what he's been up to. Um, but meanwhile, the context is so bizarre. And they're still cracking up. And I'm thinking to myself, this is not a practical joke. And Amar is not in a costume. Amar really was at my birthday party. And he, now he really is a gunman. And in a very short while, we are going to go outside where he could possibly shoot people. So, you know, I'm trying to wrap my head around this crazy situation. And it's hard for me to place the name to the face um, because now he's a gunman and before he was at my birthday party. And I don't want to be rude. I don't want Amar to think I don't remember him from my party. Like maybe we had a few drinks together or we danced together. But I really don't want to be rude because he's covered in bullets and he's holding a machine gun. So I'm just like, Amar, great to see you. Thanks for coming. You know, I'm really glad you can help out with this assignment. I, mean, I just don't know what to say to him. So we chit chat and the guys are all reminiscing for a few minutes. And then all of a sudden, Amar gets serious and he looks at his watch and he says, it's time to go on patrol now. Follow me. So we grab our gear and we follow Amar out of the office. And he takes us through Hebron and he takes us up a ridge to um, a, a hilltop where you can have a view of the city of Hebron 
where both the Palestinian side and where the Israeli settlements are. And he shows me you know, where his guys are shooting from. He shows me where the settlers shoot from. He takes me through his neighborhood and, and shows me where the neighborhood's been shot at and how they do their patrols. And all along, I'm, I'm taking pictures. And luckily, nothing happened that night. They didn't shoot at anybody, and we didn't get shot at. But nonetheless, I knew that I had great photos. I had these guys on patrol. I knew it was going to be a front page story. So after a couple hours, we finish our patrol. We say our goodbyes and thank yous. I hug Luai and Mazin. And I go back to Jerusalem. And Amar goes back home somewhere in Hebron. And I realized that just nine months earlier, we were celebrating something together at a party with Israelis and Palestinians and Jews and Muslims. And I knew in that moment that I would never be at a party with Amar again. Thank you.